my request for this evening is that you would examine what I'm saying and see if it's what the scripture teaches. I want you to try this message from the scriptures. I'm not asking you to believe anything because I said it. Try this message and see if it's what the Bible teaches. That's all that counts, isn't it? I've entitled this message, Holy and Sinful? Question mark after that. Holy and Sinful? I could have just as easily entitled this message, The Evidence of a Holy Nature. You can hear this message and know whether or not you have a holy nature. Holy and sinful. <clears throat> Every believer on this planet can be described by both of these terms holy and sinful. All of God's elect while on this earth can be described holy. They can also be described sinful, full of sin. Those two terms, holy and sinful, seem like they ought not be together, don't they? Seems like a contradiction in terms. Holy and sinful. Holy means sinless. That's the only kind of holiness there is. Sinless. Impeccable. Without the potential to sin. You, if you can sin, you're not holy. Holiness does not even have the potential to sin. This is the divine nature. Now let's see if I can back that up with the scripture. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. Hold your finger there in Genesis 25. We're going to come back there. Verse 9. 1 John chapter 3. Whosoever is born of God, what's it say? Doth not commit sin. Now there are other um, translations that will say he doesn't practice sin. He doesn't continue in sin. He does not keep on sinning. But that's not what the text says. The text says, just as God said it under divine inspiration, he that is born of God doth not commit sin. That means exactly what it says. Look what's next. Four. His seed. Whose seed? Whose seed? God's seed. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed 
God's seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. He does not have the ability to sin. He is unable to sin because he is born of God. Question, can God sin? No. Can Jesus of Nazareth sin? Can the Lord Jesus Christ sin? No. He is impeccable. I've heard so many preachers say, well, uh, he didn't sin is the point, but to say he couldn't sin means that what is there any is there any specialness about his resisting temptation if he couldn't sin? Um, if he could sin, he's not God. If he could sin, he's not immutable. You know, that's really the same uh, argument Satan used with Eve. Right now, there's no moral virtue to your innocence. You're just obeying your nature. Now, if you eat of the fruit, you'll know good and evil, and you'll choose the good over the evil, and that's what's going to make you like God. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good to her. She took of the fruit and did eat. But the point is, Christ could not sin, and that doesn't take away from the glory of his virtue and the glory of his holiness, but he could not sin. God the Holy Spirit cannot sin. He's the Holy Spirit. And that which God has birthed cannot sin. That's the point. That which God gives birth to. And is that not what being born again is? Being born of God? That which God gives birth to cannot sin. Of his own will, James says, of his own will begat he us through the word of truth. John says in John 1, 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born, which were birthed, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God, fathered by God, birthed by God the seed of God. Can that sin? No. And I'm giving what the scripture teaches. That same man that cannot sin has a sinful nature. You know what that means? That nature can't do anything but sin. That's all that nature does. It's evil. It's evil. The way Adam was born into this world, remember the Lord said, in the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. Now, he didn't die physically, but he died spiritually. And he had an evil nature. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only, did you hear that? Only evil continually. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I used to be chief. I was chief before God saved me. I'm an ex-chief of sinners. Not that way anymore. No, Paul said in his own experience, of whom I am the chief. Paul wasn't saying that trying to act humble. 
He believed himself, as every believer believes themselves, to be the chief of sinners. Now, there's a problem with that. If you agree that I'm the chief of sinners, I'm probably going to get aggravated. I'll say, well, I'm just as good as you, maybe better. That's just that old nature coming out. But every believer, without exception, knows that they are the chief of sinners. Present tense. Kind of like turning on a faucet. I've used this illustration before. You got hot water coming in one line, cold water coming in the other. They come out of that one faucet. These two natures come through one consciousness. But they're two separate natures. Now, the denial of this is a denial of human depravity. It's saying human depravity can, by grace, become better, can be acted upon, can improve. You see, this is an essential truth. This is just as important as election. This is just as important as redemption. We saw this morning that this passage taught divine election in these two men, but we're going to see the two natures in this passage of Scripture. Now, look in verse 19. And these are the generation of Isaac, Abraham's son. Isaac begat, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Pandanarim, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. There is now life. There was no life in that womb, and there is now life. And this represents spiritual life. Yes, this is a historical event that took place, but remember, everything in the New Testament is illustrated in the book of Genesis. You can find an illustration in Genesis of every doctrine of the New Testament. Now, look at verse 22. Once there's life, verse 22, and the children struggled together within her. When did life, when did the struggle begin? When there was life. You know when my real problem with sin came into being? When I was given life. Now, before I had life, that doesn't mean sin didn't trouble anyone as far as the devastations it brings. You think of the problems addictions bring to people and families. You think of the problems sexual sin have brought, the sorrow that it's brought into families, homes, and nations. Everybody deals with the consequences of sin, but only the believer struggles with the nature of sin. And that struggle is literally they crushed one another in the womb. They oppressed one another. They broke one another. They bruised one another. They discouraged one another as they struggled together. What was going on in this woman's womb, she did not know. And what does she do? If it be so... If I have life, what's wrong with me? Why am I thus? What is my problem? Why is there this great struggle within? Why am I thus? You know, I don't have to convince any believer that they have two natures. They know it. They know it by experience. Might not understand everything that's going on, but they know something is. Why am I thus? What is wrong with me? And the Lord answers her in verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Now he's not being repetitive. 
He's speaking of divine election in the two nations. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. The two, God's discriminating grace, and that's what it is. Jacob have I loved, and it's the only hope near you have. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Uh, these men are used by Paul in Romans chapter 9 to expound the glorious truth of God's electing grace. But not only are these two nations taught, two manner of men. Two manner of people. One holy, the other sinful. And one of those men will be stronger than the other. You know, that which is born of God is stronger than the flesh, isn't it? And the firstborn shall be a slave to the second. We'll come back to that at the end of this message. But this was all determined before they came out of the womb. Verse 24, here's the human explanation. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Verse 25, and the first, this is speaking of Esau, came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Now the word Esau, the name Esau, that proper name, is taken from the Hebrew verb, which means work. work. Salvation by works. He came out red. Same name as Adam. Adam means red. He came out with Adam's nature. And the scripture says he was hairy all over like a garment. I mean, he came out just completely with his own natural covering. And that garment is the same word that's used for the goodly Babylonian garment. That garment that was produced in Babylon, works religion. That Remember Achan? He stole and hid that goodly Babylonian garment, which came from Babel, the place where they tried to build a tower to heaven, the great picture of salvation by works. That's how he came out. Now, this is... Um, I don't know how to say picture this in your mind, but I've got to. Picture this in your mind. Here Esau comes out. Head first. Head first. Out he comes. His feet come out last. And when his feet come out, there's a hand clutching on to his heel. Scripture points that out. There's a hand. That struggle that was going on that hand is clutching on to his heel. And his name was Jacob, which means heel catcher. They named him after what they saw. Heel catcher. Supplanter. Now, I think it's interesting that the first time the word heel is mentioned is when? Thou shalt crush his head and he shall bruise your heel. And I know this, every believer is clutching on to that as the only hope they have. Amen. Every believer, without exception. Isaac was three score years old when she bare them, and the boys grew. Talking about Jacob and Esau. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the fields. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. Now, Esau was a Man's man. He was a hunter, maybe like 
uh, Nimrod, the mighty hunter before God. He was a very masculine man. He knew how to deceive his prey, and he was very successful at it. And as a matter of fact, you find out that that's why Isaac showed favoritism toward him. Verse 28, and Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. <laughs> that's why I loved him. He gets me good food, and he brings it to me, and I love his venison. And he showed favoritism toward this boy, and that it begins the dysfunction of this family. And like I said this morning, there's never been a more dysfunctional family. I mean, uh, look what goes on in chapter 27, the deceit, the lies, the cheating that goes on in that very family. But um, here we have Esau described as a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man. Some people thought, well, that means he was simple. Um, that word plain is translated, is found 13 times in the Old Testament. Nine times it's translated perfect. Two times it's translated undefiled. One time it's translated upright. And one time it's translated plain. God the Holy Spirit says regarding this man, Jacob, he was a perfect man. An undefiled man. An upright man. And if you would have looked at his conduct, you would have said, no, he's not. He was a deceitful man. I mean, look, I mean, his life was a continued, uh, he deceived his brother, he deceived Laban, he deceived his dad, he was just a deceptive man, and that's what the word means, and there's no justification for that. His actions were reprehensible. We would never say, well, it's okay to act the way he did. It was not. It was evil. It's evil when I am what he is, and it's evil when you are what he is. You're not excusing it. It's wrong as it can be, but yet when God describes this man, that word plain doesn't get it. It's the same way with Lot. How does the Holy Spirit refer to Lot in the New Testament? Just Lot. That righteous man with that righteous soul. Now if God says he's that, that's what he is. Jacob is described as this perfect, upright, undefiled man. Same word that the Lord used to describe his bride in the Song of Solomon. Perfect, undefiled. Now, if you would have looked at Jacob's conduct, as I said, and there's no justification for it, his character seems more of a supplanter than perfect. But this is the way the Holy Spirit describes him and every other believer. Perfect in Christ, given a new nature that does not sin. And that's the teaching of Scripture. Uh, hold your finger there and let me show you another passage, 1 John 5. We know. I love the we knows of the Scripture, don't you? We know. This is not something we're unsure about. This is something God has taught us. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. <laughs> there it is. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now, like I said, if you don't have a King James Version, you have some of these other versions. I'm not King James only. Um, some people think the King James Version is inspired. It's a translation. It's a translation. I believe it to be the best translation. I do believe that. But it's a translation. And there are other translations that will say he doesn't practice sin or he doesn't continue in sin. Well, if that's what it does mean, 
Me and you are not saved, neither were the translators, neither is anybody else. It says, he sinneth not. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that's begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one, Satan, touches him not. Do you know there's nothing for Satan to work with in the holy nature? Now, he's got plenty to work with in the evil nature. He demonstrated that with Peter. But there is nothing for him to work with in the holy nature. Two natures. Now, turn to Romans 7. Romans 7, you're familiar with this. Paul says in verse 14, for, Romans chapter 7, verse 14, for, we know, there's another one of those knows, we know. And when Paul is saying this, just like John, he is speaking as the spokesman for the elect. All of God's elect know this. We know. Don't have to convince anybody of it, don't have to argue anybody into it, they know it. We know that the law is spiritual, but I, and notice I think it's interesting how he didn't say we this time. We know that the law is spiritual, but I, now I'm talking about myself, and every believer knows this. I am carnal, not I used to be carnal, before God saved me. I am carnal sold under sin. For that which I do, I don't approve of it. I don't allow it. You know, if somebody that, is, that has a holy nature doesn't approve of sin under any circumstance. I hate sin. I would never sin again. And I don't approve of that. I don't use this as an excuse for sin. No believer does. But I don't say I don't do that. He said, for that which I do, I allow not. What I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I didn't do it. He did. That's what he's saying. I didn't do it. He did. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Do you know that? For to will is present with me. I want to be perfectly conformed to the image of Christ. I don't want to ever have another proud thought. I don't want to ever have another vain thought. I don't, want to, I don't want to sin against my God. I don't want to sin against you. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And as long as I'm in the flesh, this will be the case. I find not. I remember one time somebody told me, when are you going to get out of Romans 7 and get into Romans 8? Well, that person didn't know anything about Romans 7 or Romans 8, did they? Verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that which I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, O oh, wretched man that I am. Now, he didn't say, O oh, wretched man that I used to be. He said, O oh, wretched man that I am right now, present tense. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death, this dead, wicked body I'm carrying around with me? And some have said that Paul was alluding to a dead body chained to him, and that did happen in those days. 
I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, if you're a believer, you have two separate natures, a holy nature and a sinful nature. And like Rebecca, there is a crushing going on within a bruising a fight a struggle Paul put it this way in Galatians 5 17 the flesh lusts against the spirit the spirit lusts against the flesh these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things you would now if a man denies this all he's proving is that he only has one nature If you don't have two natures, you don't understand this. It's confusing to you. It doesn't make sense. If you have two natures, you know that it's so. Now, I've heard people say, yes, a believer has two natures, but the one you decide to feed is the one that's going to prosper. Let's think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. Who's doing the deciding of which one you're going to feed? That's introducing a third person into the equation. And that is no different than that little cartoon every one of us has seen where a guy's got an angel on one shoulder and a demon on the other, and he's listening which one he's going to listen to. That's foolishness. That's all it is. Every believer has two separate natures. And it's a continual conflict between these two men. And it's what made Paul cry, O oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? I Thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now turn back to Genesis 25 and I believe this will be helpful to us in ascertaining whether or not I have a holy nature. The Lord gives this story in this chapter to teach us something about this holy nature. Verse 29, and Jacob sawed pottage. He was in the tent <laughs> hanging out with his mom cooking. Now, there, um, I admire a man that can cook. I'm not one of them. I can't even boil water hardly. And, uh, or at least I try to keep it that way so I won't have to. But um, Jacob was cooking. He sawed pottage. He made some red stew. And Esau came from the field. He'd been out hunting. He was tired, exerting himself, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I'm faint. How many times have you said the word, I'm starving? I say that almost every day at some point. Uh, I can remember saying it yesterday. I don't think I've said it today, but I did say it yesterday. I'm starving. And I was hungry. And Esau was hungry. And when I'm hungry, I've got to eat. You know, I've always thought it's uh, interesting how people say they were so busy they forgot to eat. It ain't ever happened to me. Um, when I'm hungry, I want something to eat, and I want it now. And that's how Esau felt. Uh, he was hungry. I guess he came in saying, I'm starving. That's why his name was called Edom, Red. That's where the Edomites came from. Now, here's something very curious. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, 
I'm at the point to die. I mean, if I don't eat this soup, I'm dying. Was he going to die? No. He was hungry. But he said, I'm going to die if I don't get something to eat. What good would the birthright do me if I starve to death? He reasoned it out. This is the thing to do. Behold, I'm at the point of death, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now here is the key to understanding the holy nature. You can't look at yourself and say, well, this was holy. That wasn't, but this is. Well, what's the significance of the birthright? That's the key. Well, look in Genesis 24, 36, verse 36. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. Look in chapter 25. Verse 5. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. If you had the birthright, you had all. Christ is all. That's what the scripture says. Colossians chapter 3 verse 11. Christ is all and in all. Now let me say this with regard to Christ being all. He's all that God is. God gives all to his son. He's all in the scripture. He's all God requires. If you have Christ, you have all God requires. And do you hear that? He's not looking for anything else. He's all in your salvation. You're saved for one reason. For Christ's sake. Everything God requires of you. He looks to Christ for. Jacob had to have that. He had to have that. To Esau, it really wasn't important. Sure, it's nice, but I got to live. Esau was living for today. I need something right now. He was living for today. Jacob had to have the birthright. Now, let me tell you something I can say with as much conviction as I know how to have. I have to have Christ as all of my salvation. Because if he's not all of my salvation, I won't be saved. If anything is required from me other than the Lord Jesus Christ, him being all in my salvation, all in my acceptance, all in my experience. I mean, he's, he's, I don't look to my faith, I look to his faith. I don't look to my sorrow, I look to his sorrow. I'm resting in him. My acceptance is in the beloved, nowhere else. And if it's not, if there's anything that I have to come up with, I won't be saved. I must have the birthright. Jacob knew that. He had to have the birthright. Esau, he didn't have to have it. Do you have to have Christ as all for your salvation? Now you can, you can answer that. Do you have to have Christ as all for your salvation? Is that absolutely necessary to you? You have a holy nature. That's the reason why. 
You have a holy nature that can't be satisfied with anything short of Christ alone. You don't want anything else. You're not looking for anything else. You simply want to have Christ as all. And the only way you'll have Christ as all is if you have nothing of your own. You can't have 99% Christ and 1% you. Christ is all. Now, Jacob, he had to have Christ as all. You know, I think he was, he had thought about this. This didn't just come up. He thought, maybe all of his life, I've got to get that birthright. I've got that whatever it takes. I've got to have the birthright. And if you go on in Genesis 27, he had to have the blessing too, didn't he? He had to have the blessing. Now, this I know. Everyone that God has saved, they must have the birthright. They must have Christ as all. Everything went to Christ. And you know your only salvation is right there. And if this is um, take it or leave it, uh, I don't necessarily see this. You're Esau. You're Esau. <clears throat> now, in closing, did you notice that it said in verse 23, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, the new nature is stronger than the old nature. It's being begotten of God. That's stronger, isn't it? And it says the old nature is a slave to the new nature. The elder, Esau, is going to serve the younger. What that means is my sin, my old nature, forces me to see that Christ is all. And I don't have anywhere else to look. And in that sense, my old nature is a slave to the new nature. That's how that works. Now, what I have given is what the Bible teaches. I don't have any question about it, but I ask you to search the scripture to see if this is so. You know, I was listening to a preacher on the way home today. I turned on the radio and uh, I heard the preacher say, I'm satisfied with Christ, but what I'm afraid of is I'm afraid he's not satisfied with me. So what we need to do is work really hard hard and he started talking about all these things we need to do to make sure Christ is satisfied with us. Listen to me. Christ is satisfied with me. Thou art all fair my love. There is no spot in thee. He's satisfied with me because I don't have any sin. I'm justified. Are you, are you saying you don't commit sin anymore? No, all I got to do is breathe and I commit sin. I realize that. But I am completely satisfied to have the birthright, and I don't want anything else. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that your son is all to you, all in our salvation, all you require, all we need, and all we want. Lord, put in our heart this same desire that Brother Jacob had, to have to have 
the birthright. Bless this message for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen.